All right. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear us all right? This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and today we have a very special guest, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias, a.k.a. the Norwegian Noose, is with us. How are you doing today, sir? Blessings. Great to be uh, here and to see all of you in the chat. And uh, what a privilege. Thank you, David, for having me. Oh, no problem. We've been wanting to do this for a while, and it just seems right. like things keep coming up on our schedule. So. I know. It's, yeah, but praise God we're here now, and I pray all of you are well. Absolutely. So before we get going, how, how are you and your family doing in regards to all the craziness right now? Are you guys holding it together well? Yeah, I mean, it's things are starting to open up a little bit in California. Um, the rest, some of the restaurants are open. Um, so, you know, I finished up my teaching at the university, which was all online, right. which isn't my favorite. I like things in person and, um, yeah, it's, it's been hard, but you know, I'm close to my family. They're not far from, from me. So I get to see them and, uh, but yeah, just, we got to keep all this craziness in our prayers first and foremost absolutely yeah it's uh it's an intense situation for sure uh uncharted territory and for most people's experience of course maybe not historically but uh definitely new times so anyways uh today we are getting in the development of logos theology and this is something that I've tried to talk about on this channel, but of course you can wax more eloquently on these topics given your sophistication and philosophy. So I'm very thankful to have you on today. And uh, basically what I had in mind is maybe moving through, and we kind of discussed right before here, chronologically in the Greek philosophical tradition, starting with somebody in the pre-Socratic period like Heraclitus, who is actually talking about logos, uh, dealing with the one and the many problem, uh, positing a unifier of opposites, and then from there move into more platonic understanding of the divine mind, of forms. Uh, I know that you have a bit of expertise in Aristotle, but he takes more of a rhetorical uh, understanding of logos, if you want to talk about that. Uh, then into Stoicism and their sort of demiurgic uh, understanding, and sort of I mean, panentheism, if you will, that's kind of how I see it. Uh, their emphasis on virtue, universal reason, regard to logos, and then philo, where we're now we're beginning to see arguments for logos, the Greek concept being present in the Old Testament in regards to the wisdom tradition and Sophia, and then eventually uh, get into orthodoxy. So um, basically, I just want to let you uh, take it away, and I don't plan on doing a whole lot of talking today. So uh, if you want to start, maybe we can talk about the pre-Socratic period, Heraclitus, the one and the many, the unifying of opposites, how language is, is tied to, beginning to be tied to, or logos is being tied to language, logic, reason, order, and this sort of organizing principle of all opposites. Right. Um, I always like to begin logos with uh, historically situated when we start to see this uh, first arise. Um, I call it the, you know, the break from the myth, in the Greek, uh, myth comes from uh, muthos, and this is story. And so, as opposed to logos, which would be rational thought or speech or word. And so, what you see, particularly in the Greeks, um, prior to the emergence of philosophy or what I would call break from the myth um, is you still have some of the fundamental big questions in the Hellenized world. Uh, but what you see in Homer um, and the poets is in, in mythology is that you had a particular conception of the, the cosmos um, and the way that they began to explain these things um, was in terms of story. So what's interesting is what differentiates logos from mythos. And here you get something in uh, Hesiod's Theogony. And 
Hesiod, and I can pull up the from his Theogony, he invokes the muses. And he says, uh, from the Halokian muses, let us begin to sing who hold the great and holy mount, Halakon, uh, and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring. And one day they taught Hesiod glorious song while he was shepherding his lambs under the holy Halakon. And this word, First, the goddess said to me, the muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus, who hold the aegis shepherds of the wilderness, wretched things, of shame and weary bellies, who know not how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know when we will to utter true things. So said the ready voiced daughters of great Zeus, and they plucked and gave me a rod to shoot a sturdy laurel marvelous things and breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate things that shall be and things that were aforetime. And so you have this notion of interesting enough going back to Genesis, right? To mm -hmm. breathe into mm -hmm. um, the literal meaning of inspire is this kind of creative energy um, that enables you to sing the poetry and without them you would be mute. Now, so why am I setting this up? Because even though this is described in terms of mythos and story, you're going to see the link um, between here um, with rationality and what's true. Mm -hmm. Because notice he's already, Hesiod's already talking about distinguishing truth from what's false. And so there's kind of a, a preliminary notion of logos that's going to obviously develop. So what's unique about the emergence of Logos and the break from the myth is not only how people begin to ex give answers to the same kind of questions where, you know, where did the universe come from? What is everything made out of? Um, there seems to be a different type of methodology. So unlike the storyteller, the philosopher, the one who appeals to logos, takes responsibility for his logos. So it's not the muses inspired me. I was overcame and God breathed. But there's a notion of individuality that becomes present that enables one to actually begin to do philosophy. So I noticed historically there are a couple of different things that in order to develop some kind of precursors, in order to develop kind of logos mm -hmm. and have this kind of change in mythology from storytelling to logos, well, you needed a concept of human freedom and you also need a notion of individuality. Because notice <clears throat> in Greek mythology, um, there is no concept of the individual. Nor is there human freedom. This is why you have this kind of the Bacchic frenzies you're overcome with, um, the inspiration of the muse and stuff like that. And so that's a very different account and understanding than what you have with logos. So mm -hmm. logos to attain truth, you must have a break not only from mythology, but a concept of the individual and freedom, freedom to acquire or not. So I find that's kind of interesting historically that um, you begin to see this, this break from the myth and with it um, to enable that to happen, a notion of the individual and freedom. I think freedom is important too because you can't have rationality or truth or logos or philosophy and reasoning if everything's determined. So, like I always like to say, you know, two plus two equals four may be true, but if you have a wicked brain surgeon, you know, doing brain surgery and causing you deterministically to have that belief, you wouldn't say, well, I just appeal to my logos. And there's no sense of individual individuality or individual responsibility mm -hmm. um, within a deterministic. So, the Greeks had to break from that kind of concept in which 
everything was inspired, there was no human freedom or individuality in order to actually develop the concept of logos. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I'd like to say too, that notice within Hellenistic thought pre-philosophy, pre pre-logos, um, in the beginning was chaos. You have this again in Hesiod, um, and chaos mm -hmm. uh, in Greek means the abyss or the gap, the empty space in between stuff. Now, that's a crucial point because in the beginning was an abyss from which you don't have any apparent reason why there came to be the earth, the underground, the various things that you see around the world, uh, around you. Mm -hmm. And so remember when I had said, you know, where did, where did it all come from? Where is everything made of? In the age of mythology, there was no logos. Why? Because everything was chaos. There's, and if you begin with chaos rather than logos, there's no apparent reason why anything came to be, or there's any apparent reason why anything is the particular way that it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to actually just kind of establish historically. Uh, did you have any questions on that? Because that's going to set up, like, where did this concept of logos come from? No, I thought that was a, that was a great setup. I didn't even, I didn't even have that in mind. So no, I thought that was great. Uh, if you want to take that wherever you want to keep going uh, into Heraclitus or somewhere else, feel free. Yeah. So you get in, let's see, the very beginning philosophers would call them Milesians. So you have Thales mm -hmm. and Xenides and Alexander. And they, immediately have their notion of logos. So it's not Muthos anymore. It's not a story. Um, they're not just inspired. The universe or the cosmos and the earth and the underground aren't simply there for no reason, but according to logos. Um, and here you get the linking between logos and the Greek word arche, which is translated origin or source, beginning, principle, the rule. So why are things the way that they are? According to a first principle, a rule, mm -hmm. um, and not nothing. Okay. Thales, it's obviously water, that everything, you know, that the logos is his archaic principle. Mm -hmm. That's going to explain everything. And then you get <clears throat> with Anaximenes, um, and by the way, I think they, even with Hesiod, you start to see chaos even starting to operate as an arcade. Mm -hmm. But there's a real change with Hesiod. Mm -hmm. Hesiod's actually the one that's breaking from mythology. And because in the Homeric epics and poetries uh, that, that we read, the Iliad and the Odyssey, you find there is no mention of the individual. There's no concept that that, that idea just doesn't even exist. Hesiod is the very first person that you actually see names himself as the poet in his work. So when you, these are kind of clues for us that, uh oh, something's changing. Something's changing in Greece that we have a concept of individuality beginning to emerge. We also see in Hesiod that he starts to use chaos as a type of arche. So this is an emergence into um, logos. Mm -hmm. um, that's important. An examiner and an examinees, you have their logos that they appeal to. Their principle, their arche, is the indefinite or the infinite, the infinite. So I'll carry on. Mm -hmm. um, that explains everything. So that's an appeal to logos. 
Um, and then you have an examinee's appeal to well, his logos would be infinite error. Um, so those are the very first, what we call pre-Socratic philosophers. Right. And then um, you have Pythagoras, his, his number, <clears throat> which is interesting that everything is now, you know, out of the chaos. You have logos that puts everything into number, order, and proportion. And for Pythagoras, his logos is obviously number. See, and then you would ask about Heraclitus. Heraclitus has a really cool line, doesn't he? Um, he has in his pre-Socratics, listen not to me, but to the logos. So now you're starting to kind of get this. I find that really interesting. I could be wrong about, you know, such and such. But if you listen to the logos, the account, the reason, then you'll know that all things are one. Mm -hmm. Let me try to find another. Feel free to jump in. I'm just going to just keep going. Um, but I don't want to take up all of them. I've kind of back and forth too. Yeah, I got a few quotes from Heraclitus in regards to logos. Um, uh, one being listening not to me but to the word to the logos it is wise to agree all things are one the logos holds always but humans always prove unable to understand it both before hearing it and when they have first heard it for though all things come to be in accordance with this logos humans are like the inexperienced when they experience such words and deeds as i set out distinguishing each in accordance with its nature and saying how it is but other people fail to notice what they do when awake, just as they forget what they do while asleep. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Thus, it's necessary to follow what is common. But even though the logos is common, most live as if they have their own private wisdom. Uh, doxa, I believe. Uh, this logos is always, but human beings fail to understand it. Now that's an interesting fragment there because one of the things that they're wrestling with is the concept of change. Mm -hmm. And that Heraclitus is one of his famous statements. Um, changing at rest. Everything's in flux. Right. Everything's changing. Pantheon. The only thing that doesn't change is the fact that it it doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that the statement that statement doesn't change, and so it seems to me that what's important is in if everything's changing. If we go back to our two plus two is four. Now, notice I didn't say. Well, it's kind of like four, or one day it'll be four, or when it grows up, or it used to be four. When you have a notion of truth, there's a sense of permanence. Mm -hmm. And that if everything, if we woke up tomorrow and then that fact was five, seven, eight, um, we couldn't know anything. This is why he says it's not possible um, to step twice in the same river, the river being kind of everything changing in life. And the stepping being our attempt to grasp some sort of permanence or make some type of truth statement. Right. But I find that that is interesting in that fragment. This logos always is. So now he establishes something that's permanent. Mm -hmm. But human beings fail to understand it. Why? Because everything's in constant flux. But there's an attempt to grasp that kind of unchanging nature in the midst of everything that changes. So now we have something kind of added to Logos, too, mm -hmm. is that it's unchanging. In this, uh, th this concept of change, this is where Parmenides and, you know, arguably the father of ontology comes in with his understanding of 
uh, nothing is becoming, everything is, you know, something that is cannot come from something that is not, right. it, you know, in, right. op, direct, in, op, in direct opposition to what Heraclitus just posited before, that everything is becoming, he's more of a, you know, there's really only one stasis in regards to the logos as you're highlighting, and then everything else is in a state of becoming. Parmenides takes the opposite stance. Right. I, I think Parmenides is one of the most developed um, and far-reaching um, of the pre-Socratics, I believe, that, you know, it was Ludwig Wittgenstein that said the problem with people is that they don't push the question mark down far enough. <laughs> so, I mean, when we say that, let's get to the bottom of it, right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That, that our inquiry in, to the logos gets down until it exhausts, until it satisfies the demands of the inquiry. And that oftentimes people will settle up here. For example, uh, a famous one uh, illustration that Aristotle brings up, because basically a lot of these, if not all of the fragments that we have are essentially lost, are recollected uh, through quotes of Aristotle referring back, saying that Daly said that um, water was the ultimate principle of everything in our game. Right. But he's stupid because, you know, and then he goes into, <laughs> and he doesn't actually say that, but kind of, <laughs> that, you know, if that explains everything, because land and islands rest on water like a ship, as Staley says, then in this kind of spirit of not putting the question mark down far enough, Aristotle illustrates that by saying, okay, smarty pants, what's the water resting on? Is it just water all the way down? It's kind of this Yeah, tur turtles all the way down. Yeah, it's turtles all the way It's kind of a brilliant reputation <laughs> that um, he hadn't exhausted and gone down far enough um, such that he could obtain a logos and arcade that would explain. So uh, we see this even today that people think that empirical answers of the deal end all of everything. Is that well, we just reduce everything to to empirical. Um, the only meaningful statements um, are empirical statements. The only things that are true can be empirically verified. And then we see that that statement um, can never be empirically verified. It's like, oh, I found it. <laughs> Put it in the Bunsen burner and measure it. Um, the statement. And so it's, again, um, an attempt to find logos. It's not a logos that accounts for, for all things. So this is something the pre-Socratics are struggling with and trying to literally get down to the bottom of it. What is it that would explain all things? Matter is not going to explain relations left and right. And so what I like about Parmenides is he seems to have gone the farthest with this, identifying his archive and the, the logos with being that everything that exists has meaning. That seems to be the most exhaustive. And as you pointed out, that in contrast to Heraclitus, the Heracletian flux, you have Parmenides in which his logos and his archaic is permanent. He never there was never a time when the being was not. It's not going to end. It's always one um, and shall be, and you can't even think it not to not be. Um, you establish. So I think that's a, a further progression um, in development of logos. Um, it's, so it becomes kind of an explanation that the cosmos is ordered. Um, by the way, Heraclitus is really, uh, sorry, Anaxagoras is really good. Everything is like mixed. So he's appealing to this kind of cosmos. Now, what's interesting about Heraclitus is that Heraclitus's logos is nous, mind, because he thinks mind is not mixed. And mind comes into things mixed and then parses them out into kind of order. So 
all of this is really interesting kind of developing because this is going to set up um, when we talk about um, the patristics yeah. and the notion of logos, how there's certain things as if the pre-Socratics they're hitting on, they're getting really close at, but you get the fullness of the revelation of the logos um, within the church and within the church of fathers. And I wanted to get your response on one of the things that I thought was interesting, having done a conversation with a fellow uh, parishioner, clergy, uh, subdeacon Mark of my church, we did a video on the River of Fire, and just Heraclitus, his kind of fundamental principle was fire. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not making a, a Justin Martyr claim that he was Christian before Christianity, but I do think that it's interesting how Christianity at least at a sort of semiotic level, uses the concept of fire in regards to, and then and how that could be understood as logos, uh, one's own torment, at least from the river of fire understanding of hell, is one's own opposition to the will of God, God's will. Well, of course, that is the logos. And so uh, I was just curious on maybe your response on that, how maybe, you know, if you just think it's a coincidence, you think it's interesting, uh, archetypal pattern or, or anything like that. The other principles he uses, too, uh, love and strife, mm -hmm. um, and I think that he links that to um, things that love is what brings things together, and strife is what sets it apart. Um, obviously, he uses fire as his arcade because uh, fire is constantly changing, and it's changing other things. Um, I'm inclined to think that with the patristics, since they're immersed in this, they're going to use familiar um, concepts. Um, we see this, you know, in with the apostles as well. Even your own poets say, um, and you use that in pictures and um, terms to actually be able to explain to and reach people at their level um, and give them the revelation that was given to us. So that would be my, my hunch is mm -hmm. why they're using these things is because these people understand that. Mm -hmm. um, they understand what those terms mean. Um, and so they're going to be immersed within that language and concepts. Um, so I would expect that they, they would use that. Gotcha. Uh, well, you want to you want to keep going and move into uh, well, the sort of post Socratics and somebody like a Plato uh, in regards to now this idea of logos. We've got objective reality. I loved how you put it to uh, the concept of individualism. Something that I I, I guess I it, it's sort of ex, ex, uh, obvious, but I had never articulated it. And when you said that. That seems going to tie into even our Ordo Theologiae in regards to personhood operations essence and how we understand logos, take that individual concept that you're highlighting even further once we get into orthodox theology and the logos becomes a person and moves beyond the sort of demiurgic status it takes on with Plato, with the Stoics, that it'll take on with Philo and the Neoplatonist. Um, by the way, Plato... Um, is heavily influenced by Parmenides. He even has a dialogue. He even has a dialogue, Parmenides. Um, and so, one of the things that Parmenides was talking about, let's see, I think this is a fragment of Parmenides. Let's see. For no way may this prevail that things which are not are. But you bar your thought from this way of inquiry and do not let the habit that comes from much experience force you along this path and direct your sightless eye and your ringing ear and your tongue to decide by reason. Logos. Well, when I read that, I can actually see Parmenides in Plato, that this kind of, you know, we're blind, um, we're without, we're, everything's in flux, 
um, and changing, you're getting some from Heraclitus, right? And what's unique about Plato is that it's this appeal to the changeless, the rule, the measure, the logos, the reason that is going to become a rule, a ruler by which we can say the things that are. Um, so I find that interesting. Um, you also get within, and obviously the, for, for Plato, this is going to be the forms. He's going to associate um, logos and rationality is not in the material world. Um, this is the, the world of change, sightless eye and the ringing ear, um, the domain of doxa, you know, belief. So what Plato's going to want to get is a true belief with logos, he says in um, Theotetus, which is interesting because really in history, this is the first time that we kind of get a definition of what knowledge is. Uh, mm -hmm. tr true doxa, true belief, with an account. Um, I always like to explain that, you know, if we start unpacking and thinking about well, what does knowledge mean? You know, when I say I know that two plus two is four, well, obviously, we have to now have a kind of a concept of something changeless, because if that changed every day, then you could never have any knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so let's associate that with truth. I think, you know, kind of primitive level, that's what we mean. Like, truth doesn't change. Just the truth of two plus two, two equals four. Now, for most of the kids in college, they'll probably be like, yes, right? <laughs> yeah. But we all know kids in college are wrong. Right. But I had to spend like two <laughs> weeks getting them out of uh, relativism. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, do these. Did you these succeed? Because you, your class is probably yeah. the only one. Yeah, that's you know, the, It actually is surprisingly successful. <laughs> I have a two prong attack. One is just to show them. So if they take one line of reasoning in kind of relativism, then I kind of trap them and go, so I know that there's things that they want to hold on to that are absolute and permanent. So if they go with one line of reason, then you just bring them and you show them that they're being inconsistent. Um, they'll tend to kind of lapse back into um, their core habits of thinking. And so what's also good then is to bring in kind of practical moral things. Um, so it's not just theory, but that you don't live this way and you wouldn't want to live this way and kind of carry them through. And I'd say about a week, week and a half. I mean, there's some people that escape my um, re-education program. <laughs> a few. But it seems to me like they all, because I tell them, I'm like, look, if, if there is no logos, right, if there is no truth, um, I'm going home. I don't want to be here. Like, why am I even lecturing you? Right. Like, I'm going to go surf or something like that. I got better. You got better things to do. So, yeah, I thank God it, it works pretty well. But the idea is that this concept of truth isn't relative to what I think. Again, this is the mix up categories. Truth right. and doxa, belief, are not the same thing. Right. There's something independent of that. Some type of fact, the way the world is. So let's suppose, well, obviously, if I know something, then my beliefs need to be true, right? Wouldn't it be silly to say that my belief is false and I know something? <laughs> um, but that doesn't seem to be enough either, because you could have lucky guesses right. where it ends up, you believe something it ends up being true, but you don't know it because you guessed it. And so this is what's interesting. Then with a logos, a true doxa, a true belief with a logos, a reason, an account, a justification, then that starts to reach what we would call the standard of knowledge, actually knowing something. Mm -hmm. Well, I you know believe it's true because can I get a sort of standard? Um, so that's something new that you start to get with the logos. Um, 
but yeah, we can talk a little bit about the 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 logos, and this is going to become important when we talk about and the patristics and the fathers. Um, Plato has the logos the account, and the reason why things are the way that they are is because of the forms. Mm -hmm. And unlike somebody like Aristotle who believed the universe wasn't created, it's eternal, that Plato believed he had a, a demiurge, a lesser god, because God for him was um, this kind of immovable, monadic, beyond all things, the form of the good. And then sustaining the form of the good, Plato's notion of God, sustained all the, the eternal, the co eternal forms, the idos, the ideas. Mm -hmm. The demiurge then looks up a lesser God. Because for Plato and a lot of the Greeks, um, to create, to fashion, to make, um, seem too anthropomorphic and not godlike. And, and why? Because it implied this notion of change. Mm -hmm. And according to the Greeks, perfection was immutability. Mm -hmm. um, both in and of its own nature, but it did not act. Everything else was the way it was because of it, but it did not act. So you have kind of like the form of the good in Plato is this kind of emanation, like the, the sun or something like that. Mm -hmm. it's, the sun's the reason why that I can see things outside, and it's also the cause of all things. It causes things to grow, order the day, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So for something to actually change didn't seem godlike. It seemed to be falling away from divinity. And so the demiurge was like that. And the demiurge looked upon the forms as the kind of patterns and archetypes to make things and created the world um, accordingly. And so he's looking to the various logos. Um, that will become important when we talk about the patristics as well. Um, was there, let's see, what else could we talk about with Plato? Um, well, I think his talk of logos in regards to speech, I think that sort of naturally leads into Aristotle, who, uh, you know, again, correct me if I'm wrong on anything, but uh, Plato takes a more a priori to a deductive approach in his philosophical system, beginning with these assumptions like the logos, like the good uh, forms, and then Aristotle's moving from induction to deduction. So we see logos... Uh, be more focused from my understanding, but it's more about uh, rhetoric, it's more about the use of language, it's more about an understanding of objective truth than these larger abstract concepts like you'd see in Plato or even Heraclitus maybe. Yeah, maybe what you're trying to say is that you get more kind of a An emphasis of logos developed in, in Plato's metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, explicitly, um, I guess, because implicitly, I, I would think Aristotle would agree that like, forms are logoi, the plural of um, logos. Um, he just has a perhaps a different metaphysics but what you're saying is there's kind of more kind of a grand cosmological and metaphysical project that's explicitly stated emphasizing logos and, and Plato. correct yeah that's <laughs> better articulated thank you hey no problem <laughs> <laughs> uh what is interesting about and unique about aristotle so I imagine he's assuming a lot of like Plato's, um, it's his teacher, right? Um, his epistemology, and then he's developing that. Is that, like you said, now you start having logos is rationality and speech articulated in um, 
his logical works, um, the prior analytics, um, the organon, and you know his rhetoric. And Aristotle is now known for developing the first system of deductive logic. Mm -hmm. That reasoning from you know certain facts if done well. Now the difference between Plato and Aristotle is that the forms or the reasons why material things are so they're localized within the world. Um, but they're not located causally uh, as transcendent independent of this kind of empirical world. So Aristotle's the talents and empiricist sorts. And therefore, he develops his system of logic and classification. He's also with, um, doing you know, biology and genus and species according to to logos. And how does he know about these logos? Through sense perception. And so he develops a system of logic from what he believes um, are the most kind of evident things, the clearest things to us. And then he starts to develop using, because he's already defined, where should I grab my Aristotle book real quick? Sure, it don't matter. One second, guys. If you guys have any questions, make sure to uh, write them down at me or super chat, and we will get to those at the end of our discussion. I'm going to turn this air conditioner on. It's like 100 degrees over here. Understand. Let me know if the, if the noise bothers you guys. Bothers you guys. <laughs> this is my ancient air book. Oh, nice. Uh, you have the categories, so logical kind of categories. So notice he's just kind of developing this notion of like, you look at the world and how is it intelligible, and you divide it up into kind of 10 categories. And he talks about language, then he goes into what he calls demonstration, dem uh, demonstrable science. So all of this is going to be a development again, of uh, logos and how the kind of logical relations work. So mm -hmm. I'd say that's definitely a unique contra aerosols bring, uh, just as you pointed out, that he's bringing this into language, rhetoric. He's developing a system of deductive logic, which we still use today. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about terms in terms of logos and how those and relations can be situated in how things can logically follow. Right. And if anybody's interested to learn more about logos, make sure to hit up Dr. Uh, Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias for his logos, or for his logic class, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, very interesting, I actually signed up for the first two episodes there, so. Shout out, uh, much, uh, really good videos, much appreciated. Yeah, I'm gonna get some more. I apologize. Uh, it's been almost, I don't know, a month and a half since I've done any. Um, and that's because, you know, I was having problems with the internet. Right. I had to get this microphone right here and new cameras and stuff like that. And uh, everybody was on the lockdown too. So I'm actually putting the slides together for. Uh, lecture five and notes and stuff. So I should have that very, oh, very shortly. Excellent. Well, from uh, Plato to Aristotle, um, you want to get into Stoicism because I think uh, Stoicism seems to be making a bit of a comeback. I mean, some the, the the people who are reluctant to embrace Christianity. Uh, you know, a lot of the young men, the youth that we're seeing returning back to a sort of traditional worldview. They see Stoicism, 
uh, the meditations. Uh, they see these ideas as moving towards logos, providing a more objective reality, but they're able to stay within their sort of uh, paganistic uh, worldviews. And so Stoicism talks about the Logos Grammaticos, the way that orthodoxy then is going to deal with that, and I'm sure you can uh, speak to this. We're, we're going to re-understand Logos Grammaticos and what exactly that means, but uh, Christianity picks up the sort of uh, Stoic concept of sobriety and the emphasis of sobriety. Um, Stoicism is going to be focused on virtue. Uh, it's going to see Logos as more of a world soul. That's why I describe it, and you can correct me if you think this is... Uh, uh, inaccurate, but it seems they have a sort of demiurgic panentheism in regards to their understanding of Logos. Logos is created nature. Logos is beyond. It's a sort of mediator to the universe. Um, and then, of course, they're going to pick up um, the this same Aristotelian, if you want to go, this uh, universal reason, this, this tied, uh, Logos being tied to reason and rationality and stuff like that. So um, would, you, would you be interested in going into Stoicism? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about um, about the Stoics. Um, I always liked, uh, if you've ever read Epictetus, mm -hmm. um, Epictetus is a, another Stoic that, that people forget about. Um, and, yeah, what's nice is, well, first of all, you have to put them in contrast to the other school, the Epicureans. Right, yeah. Right, that's the, the stark contrast right. is that um, the Greeks were very interested in a very uh, found deeply uh, a deep way about um, eudaimonia. There goes my... Oh no, my your icon. <laughs> I, I, I told them that it was going to come. I can't get... The, I got this new icon up and I wanted you guys to... Um, something holy um, <laughs> and uh, I knew that this, the tape was not working so I'm going to have to get that better but it, I, I told you that if it fell down it wasn't because we were speaking about anything evil well notice actually <laughs> maybe it's right we were just speaking about um, the Epicureans right. that fell down yep. Ple pleasure seekers yeah. and uh, the Theotokos <laughs> was like I choose not to yeah. Engage in this conversation. <laughs> Those dang hedonists. That's right. Um, the Greeks were uh, profoundly concerned with happiness, eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. Everybody is, but what we mean by happiness, and uh, which was translated human flourishing in Greek, is quite different from philosophy to philosophy, from paradigm to paradigm. So the Epicureans, they, well, how do you achieve human flourishing? What is it to be truly flourished? Um, pleasure. It, it just, it, it almost kind of seems to me like a, a really like child, in terms of philosophy, um, a really kind of primitive and childish way of like thinking. Mm -hmm. Almost like caveman, like, well, how do we get happy? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Two things that make you feel good. Yeah. Right. Uh, that was the Epicurean. Do what makes you feel good, which we live in in the Epicurean society. The, the patron now. philosopher of America. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, the Stoics were responding against, were against. Um, and I think you even see the seeds of this in Plato, um, Plato who said too much freedom is enslavement, is slavery. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think that's something that could be really relevant for everybody in this day and age. Right. That we're all, there's just these slogans all the time, like, freedom! <laughs> like, I'm free to do whatever I want. Um, it's like, well, I, I guess you are, but it's a free country. I can do I'm free against terrorists. Um, <laughs> all this, and it's just sold to us everywhere. Right. And the idea is that, well, think about it in terms of the Epicureans, that you're free 
to engage in sexual um, activities and drinking and eating as much as you want. Um, and what's appealing is the idea that I'm free. I'm my own boss. I'm my own God here. I don't have to listen to anybody. Um, right. That is kind of appealing, right? You don't have to boss me. I can do whatever I want. I'm free to do. And it ends up being a Trojan horse and it's a trap. Because now you're no longer free to resist the sexual attachments, the food, the vices that you develop. Um, and then also, I think something really interesting in terms of, and we would associate this in the Orthodox with the passions. And by passions, we don't mean feeling passion about something. But the idea that when we're engaged in these, uh, these passions and we become prisoners mm -hmm. and, and slaves to them. Right. It really makes it so we can't achieve the logos. Exactly. We, no, we can't see it correctly. I was I was just speaking about this in my in my last live stream. Uh, a gentleman that I went to high school, went to elementary school with, middle school, high school. He recently died of a heroin overdose, and I was just using the idea of addiction, which we're addicted to the world in so many different ways, and trying to take an orthodox theological perception where this idea of freedom as you're articulating with the Epicureans, with what we would see in libertarianism in America, it's actually a form of, of slavery in and of itself because you're going to be attached to this world. And the and the, so the paradox is that the ultimate form of freedom is to really be a slave to God, which is counterintuitive, but that's the, by not being attached to this world is the only way in which you can transcend this world. Right. Isn't that, so it's inversing the, so notice that the trap is too much freedom. So that sounds really good. And then you lose the freedom. Mm -hmm. And then when we make ourselves slaves um, to the other, rather than ourselves, right? So rather than going inward and be like, I want to do whatever I'm free with, that we sacrifice our freedom and become slaves to, to God, spouses, our neighbors, um, so that and what do I mean by slave? Um, my life is no longer my own. I'm giving it. Um, so free, I'm freely entering into slavery. Mm -hmm. I always liked that uh, the late Tristan Englehart would, uh, he'd always say, begin these things with like uh, shocking like statements. And he had this like Texan accent and he'd be like, of course, sir, I believe in slavery. And People were like, my God, he's like, I'm a slave to God, my wife. <laughs> you start going down the list of like, you're like, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a sense that we always have to believe um, in slavery, um, that we freely abandon our lives that we own, that we try to own ourselves and give that um, freely our lives to the first and foremost because the greatest command is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then, interesting enough, that actually just the opposite frees us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like the, it reminds me of the gospel, he, he who seeks to preserve his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will preserve it. It's always the inverse of the demonic right. um, temptations. Mm -hmm. um, what else shall I say about the Stoics um, that will be interesting for us orthodox, now you probably get this in Plato as well, but it becomes quite articulated in a much more definite sense with the Stoics. Philosophy is not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just reasoning, um, an abstract reasoning. It's a kind of practice or exercise, uh, the Greek word is uh, asthesis, mm. uh, asceticism. Um, and the idea, you definitely have this in Plato, is that in engaging in logos, um, a life of logos, a, a practice, an exercise, that one is able to achieve virtue in vice versa. When one practices and engages in, in the exercises of virtue, one is able to obtain logos and reason. 
I think that you see this played out more profoundly in the Stoics. That the life of virtue is a practicing um, not engaging, becoming addicted to the passions. And therefore, the philosophic life to become kind of, it's a therapeutic aspect yeah. of life that you have a mutual beneficial, you're able to achieve logos and virtue at the same time. And it, it transforms. Um, that's going to become very relevant for us Orthodox, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I, I want. I thought that that was a, you know, that that emphasis on virtue and virtue being a way in which you, you align yourself then with logos as a lifestyle, is certainly it's something that's carried on into orthodoxy. Then somebody like a Marcus Aurelius is sort of Plato's philosopher king who um, takes these ideas a little bit further. Now we can we can reject uh, you know the Republic and the general framework that Plato has, but. It seems like he kind of manifests, he kind of embodies a lot of those ideals in regards to virtue and being more um, nuanced, more thoughtful in his worldview and in his actions in an effort to, again, accord with the Logos. Yeah, what's great about Marcus Aurelius, he has a book called To Himself, uh, The Emperor's Diary, he was writing To Himself, where he reminds himself that... Um, what the Stoic teachings are and holds himself accountable um, when he fails to incorporate the teachings in his own life. Now, why do I like that? Um, first, because it shows that philosophy is a therapia, is not simply an academic exercise. Mm. And furthermore, harkening back to our kind of conversation about uh, you know, the modern day relativists, I always tell the students, don't ever buy a philosophy you can't practice and live. Mm, oh, uh, that's, we, that's good. We all can't stand hypocrites. And the reason why is because um, it's an inconsistency. They're not practicing what they preach. Now, why would we build a whole worldview on a complete hypocrisy? And, and so I try to get in an inconsistency. I try to get the students to see that, that none of you actually believe this. You don't live this way. These aren't two separate realms. And I think that's sometimes uh, a bad representation of philosophy mm -hmm. is that everybody's in their ivory towers um, thinking about um, – when are you ever going to run into a situation where five people are tied up on the train track and your mother's on the other side of the train track and you've got to pull the lever, right? Yeah, the, like, utili you guys the utilitarian dilemma. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, like, you're just up in these ivory tower, like, this doesn't have anything to do with reality. Um, there probably are philosophies like that, and you should avoid them. So what I like about the Stoics is – this, and, and you get this with Plato as well, the synthesis that philosophy is not simply um, an intellectual academic exercise, that it's a life, it's mm -hmm. a way of living that's supposed to make you a better human being, um, to live well, and that you should hold yourself accountable if you are not embracing your own teachings. Right. Um, that's pretty neat about Marcus Aurelius and that he's able to explain this as well on something like the Stoics that I think we all can appreciate because we're going to say that with orthodoxy too. Orthodoxy isn't a dogma, a religion. It's a way of life. Does that mean it doesn't have dogma? No, of course not. But it, isn't it much like what the Stoics are saying? Mm -hmm. The two need to work in symphony and synergy together. Um, if all your canon law and all your dogmas don't change one life fundamentally or reach out to somebody in their suffering, what use is it? Right. And so I think that's why it's important to go that to emphasize, like the Stoics, that. It's logos. It's the reason. It's what makes sense 
but this logos is a life and it's a life that must be practiced and lived mm -hmm. and this makes one more human mm. which is what we all want and this one mm. gives one human flourishing true happiness mm. I, I love that uh, of course we're not to the orthodox yet but that phrasing it makes you more human uh, is beautiful and, and even thinking in, in regards to the incarnation and and by following the logos, we can actually become fully human. Right. Uh, that, that, that's really a beautiful thought. I guess it admits that we're, we were created to be like this. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it to be human? Um, the image of what's to be human is in the logos of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is what we're actually, right? Um, trying to develop into. This is why Christ, even though he always remains in person, the divine person, um, the human, in, the, the archetype of, of the human image is within the divine. So we're created to be divine. And that is what is truly to become human, is to, to be um, truly like the Logos. Right. Right. No, that's that's beautiful. Uh, so maybe now we can move into the sort of representation of Middle Platonism, uh, Philo Judaeus of Alexandria, and now we're beginning, or at least there's been an attempt in him to see this concept of logos that had been developed at that point for about, well, what, 600 years, 500 years, and seeing this now present within the Old Testament scripture in regards to the angel of the Lord, Sophia, um, and stuff like that. Of course, he doesn't talk about Christ. Uh, that's going to be reserved for St. John the Theologian. But um, would you? Would that be something you'd be interested in going into Philo then? Yeah, I'm not too you know, familiar with Philo, but um, you know, you're definitely getting like Logos linked to God. Yes. Um, and Logos being reason. Um, reason. Um, and this is going to be quite beneficial for uh, and tying into to Revelation as well. Um, let's see, what else can we say about um, well, I love in my mind, um, there's a four bullet points that I pulled out in regards to where I see him grabbing different concepts uh, from things that we've already talked about. Uh, the unifier of all things seems like he's grabbing from Heraclitus. Uh, I have his classics of Western spirituality. So I went through this for a video and found every place in which he ever mentions the logos and tried to. Oh, good. And so um, it seems like he grabs the sort of unifier of opposites, the sort of Heracletian understanding and then he moved, you know, he had, of course, being a middle Platonist, has uh, Plato's forms, but he also is a big fan of Aristotle and that eminent reason, that focus on reason and, and rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And then also the mediator to the universe uh, of Stoicism, because for at least from my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that Philo being a middle Platonist starts to move in towards a sort of what we would consider a Neoplatonist understanding of the emanationist. And so, so he's seeing the Old Testament God, and then he's seeing an emanation, the first emanation of that God being what he calls the Logos. And he ties this to the Hebraic tradition of Moses as the educator of Pythagoras and Plato. He believed that Moses was like the first philosopher. So right. um, it, it seems like then he's, he's putting all these ideas together, and we're seeing now what the Neoplaton, th th this differentiation that's going to occur in regards to emanationism of the logos or orthodoxy who's going to fully express this within a, trini a trinitarian understanding of god um but he's moving there he has like this weird trinity but it's all emanationism right um he's gonna have an emphasis on from what i remember unity too the logos is uh, god's unity um i'm trying to remember what he says about the principles of contraries and like Good and evil. Um, 
text from <clears throat> Yeah, I can't find that. I'm not too up to date on Philo, but I think we said it really well. Okay, well that's that's fine, no big deal. Um, well, let's move into then maybe where you are of much more expertise expertise and special uh, 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 speciality than I do in regards to the patristic fathers uh, moving into orthodox theology. Um, can you start to talk about um, orthodoxy and how then they're appropriating or for lack of a better word, at least taking these concepts, uh, redefining them. Uh, you did a video with uh, Jay Dyer on sort of terminology, the jargon, the theological jargon, and how orthodoxy redefines a lot of these um, Greek philosophical concepts, nous, logos, all these things. But when I think of logos theology and I think of orthodoxy, I also think it as being distinct from the rest of Christianity. I think of Logos as a person, so our order of oper or order theologiae or op is going to be a little bit different. Um, logos as a hypostasis being emphasized in orthodoxy, uh, and then the logos logoi distinction again unique to orthodoxy, uh, which is going to be tied to theosis, which is going to be tied to our anthropology of the noose and how we actually interact with the logos. And so, in my mind, I'm seeing all these things being unique to orthodoxy being redefined and therefore providing a fuller explication on what the Logos is, but also an extremely unique understanding of the Logos and how we can actually interact with it and how the Logos is God. Yep. And so, again, we're getting another break. Um, uh, divergence. Um, what's unique about orthodoxy? Father, so can you get a little closer to the microphone? So philosophy is a break from the mythology um, when it comes to orthodoxy and logos there's a certain type of break from philosophy um, as you had pointed out in the ordo theologia the way that we approach the logos um, this is something that you see when we're speaking about the Greeks and the Neoplatonists, an emphasis on logos is unity um, and oneness. It's impersonal. It's an impersonal force. We talk about the emanations. What's so amazing about orthodoxy, I mean, beginning with St. John, is that um, he ties it into the revelation that you see in nature in light of the supernatural revelation, because as Demetrius Stanley says, we only understand natural revelation in terms of supernatural revelation. Everything is supernatural revelation in that sense. Mm -hmm. So the Greeks were picking up on truth. They were tapping on in, into logos, um, but they didn't have revelation. They didn't have, and we even see this um, with God working with the Hebrews. He's, his revelation becomes um, a development. Like he, he reveals, what do I mean by that? He reveals more and more of himself, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. um, and so what's unique about orthodoxy is we can speak about the philosophers is grasping and touching on some of God's revelation. But they didn't know how to basically, they didn't have a paradigm in how to incorporate. This is why they're all coming up with different things and saying um, different philosophies. Because they don't have the complete picture, the complete paradigm. But then this idea of the logos being transcendent where man has to just kind of touch on it and speculate and go, well, I think it means this, and um, that's what philosophy seems like to me. <laughs> the Logos is like, I can just picture, like, the second person in Trinity, oh, my gosh, what a mess. <laughs> people trying to philosophize about me. Um, I better go down and incarnate myself. And <laughs> So, well, what's unique is that the Logos 
becomes one of us mm -hmm. and gives us the entire fullness of the revelation. It becomes personalized. And so now truth and reason isn't understood as an abstract such and such uh, or something utterly transcendent. It becomes personal. You cannot, and Maximus will talk about this too in terms of love, that you can only understand the truth, the logos, if you have love. And if you have love, then you know the truth. Mm -hmm. And this is personal. Can you have love is, is something not personal? Um, I'd also say that this idea of the one and the many. And you see this, here's the problem of origin. Origin embraced all this Greek Hellenistic and wouldn't give it up, right? That right. has to be absolute unity. That's perfection, right? And then right. following from or change or multiplicity um, is a moving away from perfection. So he's holding on to this kind of ancient um, Hellenistic cosmology in philosophy. And I think he's still keeping, origin still keeping the logos is a cosmological principle and, and not incarnational. This is what's amazing about Maximus. He takes the cosmological mm -hmm. principle of logos and makes it incarnational mm -hmm. by means of a dynamical relationship between the ideas of will and love. So you could get this in Ambigua, Maximus uh, Ambigua 23. Mm. And what he means here is that one cannot conceive of the logoi of creation. So now this is going back to the idea that um, everything that's made is made through the logos. There's nothing that, hearkening of the prelude of John, yeah. there was nothing that was made that was not made. That means there is a logoi for each created thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Maximus talks about, um, here I'll read, we believe that a logos of angels preceded the creation. A logos preceded the creation of each of the beings and powers that fill the upper world. A logos preceded the creation of, the human, of human beings. The Logos preceded everything that receives its becoming from God, and so on. Um, let's see. This Logos, whose excellence is incomparable, ineffable, and inconceivable in himself. Now, that's interesting. Notice with the Greeks, Logos is the principle of rationality. Yeah. So when you understand something, you grasp the Logos. Maximus distanced himself from that by making it apophatic. Mm -hmm. um, the excellence of the Logos is incomparable. It's ineffable. It's inconceivable. It's exalted beyond all creation and even beyond the idea of difference and distinction. Um, and don't, wouldn't you agree that that hints at, again, that apophatic nature to orthodox theology helps distinguish the energy essence distinction which, yes. which then the, the, the philosophical traditions aren't going to be able to do. And so they fall into these same patterns over and over and over by making essentialist claims about logos. Absolutely. Um, his reference there to difference and distinction is uh, a jab at the philosophers. Is the logos is what differentiates and makes distinctions, right? This is what you do within logic. Mm -hmm. So with regard to Aristotle, within cosmology, and he's saying it is the reason for all the things that, that are and continuing to be the way that they are is a logoi from the one logos, um, but it's inaccessible. You can't compare it. You can't, so like you said, radically apophatic in nature. Um, but what's interesting is, although what's inconceivable and ineffable cannot be reached by my intellect, i.e. philosophy, you can love what you don't understand. 
And so notice now it becomes one of us, it becomes personal um, through the idea of will, God's free will and love. And so Maximus goes on to say that one can't basically conceive of logoi of creation apart from the logos of God expressed in that dynamical movement of love. He goes, um, let's see, the truth possessed by logos of existence depends only upon love, not upon some objective structure of a rational kind, which might be conceivable in itself. So that's the view of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right? What right. does Logos become? It becomes now, where's the break? So they were touching on it. The philosophers were touching on it, but it's like they were blind, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I don't know. It feels like a, a, a bird. Really? It feels like a bird. It feels like a, a muffler. I mean, um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what it, it feels like. Then the light comes in and it reveals itself in its fullness is being a person mm -hmm. um, and they can only be participated in since it's apophatic they can only be participated in in love because like i said here's a break for the greeks logos was a, obtained by reason it's what reason knows um, maximus here and the, the rest of the patristics saying that it's apophatic it's unattainable, it's inconceivable. But you can you can participate, you can love what you don't understand. That's mm -hmm. what's so beautiful. And in loving what you don't understand, it illumines your understanding, um, which is, like you pointed out, the order of the elote. We start with personhood in divine revelation first and not philosophy. So there we get a break from the Greeks, also from origin as well. Uh, let's see, should I pull another Maximus quote? Absolutely. <clears throat> this is going to be a smack at origin in Greeks here. <laughs> if one approaches the Logos concept from the viewpoint of nature, one is forced to say that God knows created beings according to their own nature. So notice when I mentioned that he's talking about will and love. Um, if you approach Logos in the terms of nature, then it makes God dependent upon nature. And therefore, he's not completely free. Mm -hmm. So that would be a huge problem. It's a problem that the Greeks had, and then anybody um, within Christendom that tried to attach to that kind of methodology. But in contrast, what you're going to see is Maximus, who states, here's another good one. God does not know things according to their own nature, but he recognizes them as the realizations of his own will. So this is where we get the thought wills, mm. since he makes them through his will. So that's in Big Year 23. Mm. Um, I find those are wonderful quotes. So here is the problem in... In Greek thought, philosophic thought, so let's say you get to the point where now God is associated with Logos. But Logos and God are conceived in terms of nature. This is why we Orthodox would reject natural theology, right? Because it's embracing the project of the Greek pagan um, philosophers and all the problems that, that it brings in the classical that, foundationalism yeah. that comes with that approach. Mm -hmm. um, God's is necessary, like everything else in nature. Right. Which means he's not utterly free. Um, so this is why you'll get, within Roman Catholic thought, with uh, absolute divine simplicity and workings out, especially in Aquinas, um, that why does God create? Um, why does God do such and such? What do they appeal to? His own nature, his logos, right, is a determining factor. Okay, what they're doing is they're conceding in logos in terms of nature. Mm -hmm. And what we need to see here is that God has an infinite amount of logoi energies 
and that why does such and such exist? Because he freely wills it. So thought wills through his, his logo. Mm-hmm. But the logo I do not determine that God wills. So it's an inversion of theology, isn't right. it? Yep. That's why we, like, if you right, correctly pointed out, we have a different order of theology. It, 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 regarding this concept, and I don't mean to, uh, you know, chastise anybody, but somebody like an E. Michael Jones, who I think is doing a lot of good things right now in regards to cultural commentary, moving people back towards a Christ-centered life. But the way that he talks about logos and phrases it is still rooted within this Greek philosophical tradition just by talking about, even though I like the phrase logos rising, but talking about the logos of history. It's like, well, there's this order, you know, it's, it's like this uh, organizing principle of this thing. It's this abstract philosophical concept that's opposed to which he does at points, you know, talks about the personhood of the logos as Jesus Christ, incarnating as Jesus Christ. But, you know, some of the things that I found very interesting is in, in discussions, he talks about orthodoxy being neoplatonic, um, yeah. which seems very counterintuitive to me, uh, given that he's Despite a Thomist. Our condemnations of neoplatonism. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, just being just being a Thomist himself and somebody that would subscribe to absolute divine simplicity, uh, I just find it difficult to to see how we somebody would point the finger at orthodoxy as being Neoplatonic when you're taking on the whole project of natural theology and the emphasis on unity as the uh, concept of perfection and immutability and all that stuff. So. Uh, didn't know if you have any thoughts on that. And I, again, I'm not trying to cause any ruffles, but it just, I, it seems very interesting. Yeah, it's come I, I up... had the same kind of um, reaction to that. The, and it's not that Roman Catholics believe this, but I think because of the project being the same project of uh, the Greeks, that you get talk like this. But it appears to be impersonal, doesn't it? Exactly. This kind of abstract, transcendent, um, unifying principle. And it seems to go backwards. That it's it's personal. It's a it's and it became one of us. Right. Um, and where's the notion of love too? Um, if we're talking about you cannot conceive of the logos. And the other, th- without love, the other thing I'd say too that, that's problematic is, and this is a problem with, I would say, um, natural theology as a whole, is this kind of evidentialist approach mm. that, mm-hmm. well, the logos obviously just means the same thing for everybody, right? It's just this kind of common. We all just have access to the logos, right? Whenever we're doing something, we have the logos. Right. That, well, obviously, if we study the history of philosophy, um, and just the rundown that we did now, like, everybody's understanding the logos in a completely different way. Right. In that without the logos being personal and through love, the movement of love, that dynamic movement of love, becoming incarnate, and as uh, Maximus talks about taking the concept and passing logos from cosmology into incarnation by that dynamic movement of will and love, um, there's nothing we could know about logos. It's all just blind speculation. That's why what's revealed to us is that it's apophatic in nature. You can't understand it. This is why everybody's coming up with a million different philosophies about what they think the logos is. Exactly. So I think that it's dangerous that E. Michael Jones speaks that way, that as if we all just have this kind of universal common idea of what logos is, um, right. apart from the fullness of revelation and personal, you know, being personal. Um, so that's what my critique would be. Right. Is that you don't even? I mean, look at love. Like, what does love mean? Uh, 
depends on what your paradigm is, what your philosophy, what your right. world view. I think they would just point to I, they would just point to Webster's, open up the page, and then just point mm-hmm. a finger. And again, that is the presuppositional problem that we're dealing with. The Webster's Bible of the <laughs> Yeah. Um, and the more that you see people argue with one another, you start to realize that there isn't this common ground. Mm-hmm. Now, reality is a common ground, and the will always appeal to that. What's well, the same reality? Um, but the way that we perceive it, the, you know, the way that we see or hear something is different from person to person. Why? Well, it depends on your preconceptions, right? Right. Um, if you believe that there's no such things as ambulances and when a siren goes by, like, you're going to reinterpret the exact same sound to be something else. Um, so I think that's really important is to understand that it's apophatic in nature, we can't know, and that it's revealed to us personally in the fullness of faith. And one of the things that's revealed to us is you had pointed out with the Greeks and the problem with origin is the stressing that unity over multiplicity. Mm-hmm. The oneness is the perfection. And multiplicity and change um, is a falling away from perfection or being. And so what you get with the patristics is a synthesis of the one and the many. Uh, it's through the one logos that everything was made in which all the many logoi, um, the intelligible models, exist. And there's this kind of communion between the one and the many because they are in God, right? Um, and this is revealed to us. Now, in the- So I find that that's a, a unique yeah. um, in contrast to the other philosophies. And would you agree that that would be a collapsing of what Dyer is always hammering on uh, his streams is the problem of dialectics and see how orthodoxy is collapsing this tension between the one and the many. And, you know, so collapsing that dialectical problem into a more holistic understanding. Right. And it just reveals your own paradigm. It's like, well, I define many is the opposite of the one um, in that one is perfect and therefore many again it's presuppositional it's like right. well there's your problem buddy <laughs> exactly <laughs> stupid assumptions like that um no you're gonna go well, how do you know that your assumption um it's because it's revealed to us um and notice this is from ambiguous seven mm. from maximus and it's going to parallel the same Chalcedonian um, Christological um, definition um, in hypostasis. Um, but let's see. And big one seven by Maximus. He will also know that many logoi are of the one logos. Well, is that possible? One of many are opposites. Right? <laughs> to whom all things are related and who exists in himself without confusion. He essentially an individually distinctive God, the logos of God, the Father. So in the Trinity, you have a perichoresis, right? Mm-hmm. Persons all existing in one, where one um, in the triad are not in opposition, but exist in one another and also in the hypostasis of Christ and the two natures um, completely united but distinct not confused so I find it interesting that here in ambiguous 7 when he's speaking about the logos and logoi he's using the same type of pattern that's made in the Chalcedonian confession Mm. why because this is our revelation. This is what's, um, and it, it's breaking from that Greek. One can't be many, and many can't be one, and one is perfect, and many is a falling short. 
So yeah. I thought that was an interesting one. To Absolutely. And maybe you could move that into then uh, talking about what is the hypostasis? What is what is this idea of personhood that is, again, being uniquely identified here in the beginning of Christian theology, what we would say maintained within Orthodox theology? What is that concept? What is How, how does Orthodoxy understand this personhood? Yeah, you'll find that in Greek philosophic thought, there was never developed um, a notion, a sophisticated notion or philosophy of personhood. Um, you have, and by the way, in Greek thought, person is, um, sorry, hypostasis is the, the being or essence of something. And so there, we've talked about this before, that there's going to be a development within that term because there's a link between mm -hmm. between this. Right. Now, prosipon is the Greek word for person, and I think it means like something like a mass or a mass that right. like the actor puts on and plays the and this is gonna be really interesting too that so one of the problems is that person and personhood within orthodoxy is not simply the manifestation of an essence. And this is one reason why you're never going to get this developed in philosophic thought or in Greek philosophic thought is that person transcends nature. Now, what is philosophy? Mm -hmm. Philosophy is an understanding, the science of understanding nature and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Now, if personhood, if there are no natural or logical or metaphysical laws that can encapsulate personhood, then it transcends nature, fusus, essence. So, if what we understand are essences, what something is, and we can develop a science of that or a philosophy to talk about, oh, forms and essences and stuff like that, we can never do that with something that transcends. It's sort of like when you see um, if the empirical sciences talk about the natural world, they can never talk beyond the natural world, right? Now they try to all the time. Like, well, what happened before the natural world, right? Mm -hmm. Come join me. As I, <laughs> um, and it's like, and then you're out of bounds. Like, you're now changing. You're no longer doing science. You're right. doing metaphysics. So in this sense, philosophy can never actually do what is beyond the bounds of philosophy. So th there's something mysterious and, and mystical and transcendent about persons. However, there is a link that um, the essence of what we are always exists in the mode of a person. Mm. So they de definitely didn't have right. any idea of that. And so I think you get a link there with the whole mass, right? Like historically how this is developing. So here's what I am. The mass is the mode in which I'm existing, right? The per like the person that now, obviously, that's not the patristic definition, but I'm trying to show how historically this probably developed into hypostasis changing from substance and essence to person, and with the revelation too that person's always first that we cannot conceive of what a human being is outside of the mode of a person, and we cannot conceive of God like the philosophers have done. We cannot conceive of God, what he is, without understanding him as person, mm -hmm. um, three persons. 
first and foremost. So will that's what harkening back to what you said, or a theolog, how do we understand what God is? He reveals through his persons, persons first, not philosophy and essences first. Mm-hmm. Just like Maximus says, how do we understand what logo in the logos is? Love. Without love, you cannot ex- understand the logos. Mm-hmm. Um, and the truth possessed by the logos, the existence depends upon that love, not some, again, rational, abstract nature. Um, St. Basil talks about that. Human nature, divine nature, don't exist in some naked, objective state. They always exist in the mode of a person. So that's interesting. So now we have the link between logos and hypostasis interpreted, uh, understood in terms of the patristic notion of hypostasis, this person. So notice how these are all linked. Now, what I like about what the patristics say is, is that notice you can't separate these things out. So this is kind of like what E. Michael Jones is doing. Is like, I feel like it's, um, do I have like a cloth or something, like a fabric that with like a, a pattern or something, like a picture, and you feel that you could take like just, imagine if they were all, like something was all hinged on each other, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. What are those? Um, what are those games with the blocks? Like, oh, like Minecraft? Uh, like or you the, mean the, you mean like the pattern ones where you're always trying to put them in patterns? You're, you're trying to like it stacked up and you're trying to right. pull one out. Now, um, so uh, imagine that each block was contingent on support such that if you pulled it out, it, the whole Tetris. thing Tetris. Isn't it called Tetris? No, they have a, like a game of like, no, literally like wood blocks that like you could have in your house oh and that's okay. like hey what's the name of that game going up to my wife <laughs> hey, that's what you use wife's for hey sweetheart what's the jenga jenga yeah somebody put that in the chat <laughs> jenga. now with the jenga you can actually see how far you can get can imagine if like each one of those blocks if you pulled one the whole thing came down this is what I feel like E. Michael Jones and philosophers, uh, definitely natural theology attempts to, let's just look at this thing apart from the, you don't realize that it's all contingent in a web mm-hmm. of support. Right. So you're seeing this in the patristics too. Logos doesn't exist apart from person. Logos doesn't exist apart from love. You can't understand logos. Unless it was a person and became one of us. You can't understand logos apart from love. Um, and you can't love without logos. It's all tied into the whole revelation, the whole story. Um, so I really like that the fathers point that out. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's an attempt at, again, freedom means autonomy. <laughs> Well, I want to be free to construct it the way I want, or I want to be able to pull it out and have it my way. Right. Um, but it doesn't work that way. The, the fullness of these revelations, what these terms mean and how they're understood, is in terms of the entire revelation given to the Orthodox Church of the Theanthropos God and the Logos. Right. No, that was great. You know, we've already been going for about an hour and 40, so I don't mean to yeah, take up. Yeah, we can take, uh, we can take uh, yeah. a recall. Super Any chats. Yeah, or? we have a few super chats, but um, if it's okay with you, there's one more aspect of orthodoxy mm. and logos that I wanted you to talk more on. And that was on the logos logoi in the anthropology of the noose, because the way in which we can interact with the logos is also, in my, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that to be a unique feature of orthodox theology that you're not going to see within the sort of beatific vision that you encounter with uh, Catholicism or absolute divine simplicity with making essentialist claims about the essence. Um, Am I, am I correct or am I wrong here in regards to the way in which we interact with the logos through the logoi with our news is unique and is another dimension within Orthodox theology? Correct. Yeah, so one of the reasons why you won't get this in the West, 
Uh, you already hinted a little bit about this before earlier, is that um, with absolute divine simplicity, that each of the, again, notice what absolute divine simplicity is. It's simply the Greek philosophic model about God. Unity over multiplicity, and because God can't have any multiplicity, he has to be absolutely one, one logos. So they wouldn't even have a concept. They would just collapse logoi into the one essence of God. And what's unique about orthodoxy is what you get in Palamas and Maximus um, and the fathers is that the logoi, in which the one logos is present in, in all the logoi, of the logoi present in one logos, the logoi are God's, what God does, his activities, his energies, his eternal activities. And so because, so what are we doing here? We're associating the logoi in orthodoxy with the divine energies that are separate from his essence. Because mm -hmm. there's nothing to be said as St. Basil um, and Gregor Nisus, there's nothing to be said about God's essence beyond transcendence. It's, and so how do we know what God is? First, we know what God is through who he is. We encounter, we can never know what he is. But we know who he is and what he does. His multiple logoi and divine energies. And because there's a communion, because everything that's created is created through the logoi. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all of nature participates here. I'll just get a quote from Maximus. If you, I hope you guys don't mind me quoting a lot of Maximus. But, I love it. Um, I mean, you got some Dionysius in here, too. <laughs> this same Logos, whose goodness is revealed and multiplied in all things that have their origin in him, with the degree of beauty appropriate to each being, recapitulates all things in himself. Through this Logos, there came to be both being and continuing to be. But from him, the things that were made came to be in a certain way, tropos, mode and for a certain reason, the logo. And by continuing to be, and by moving, they participate in God. Participating proportionally in God, whether by intellect, by reason, by sense perception, or um, vital motion, or some habitual fitness. This is a great inspired Dionysus, the Arabic thought. Consequently, each of the intellectual and rational beings, whether angels or human beings, through the very logos according to which each was created, and who is in God and is with God, is called and indeed a portion of God through the logos that preexisted in God. And so through our own, through the, the creation, right, that was created through the logo, um, we're able to, like, coming back to what you were saying too, we're able to participate in our news and get to know who God is. Globally. Mm -hmm. And so there is this communion mm -hmm. and uh, experience and participation of God in proportion. Um, so that's all explained through the logos in terms of the energies mm -hmm. and activities. So just like I get to know who you are through the things that you do, um, I get to know who God is through the things that God does, sustains, continues in existence, and through the very image implanted, right, we're made in the divine image, man, we're made in his image, logos, right. that we get to actually, in our news, a part of hearts and most inner being, get to know God, but of course, um, our news becomes darkened, because the, the passions through hate, through evil, right? This is why I'm saying we can't actually, we can't speak anything true. We can't actually see the Logos. We can't see paradise when we're engaging 
when vice, when we're not in love. And so when we begin to, as Jesus, practice the love and imitate the divine activities, the love, we begin to see God all in all. Right. We begin to reestablish uh, paradise lost becomes paradise restored. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much. That uh, and thank you so much for this conversation and giving us your time. This has been phenomenal, and I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. It's a step by step progression of these ideas and how they developed. Um, so, in regards to the super chats, we have the first one from our good ortho buddy Owen or Eugen, as he uses her his Germanic spelling. Uh, thank you, brother, for the ten pounds over on the other side of the pond. And he says, Father Ananias. What do you think we as laymen can do to stop GoArch and the OCA from drifting more into cuck territory? Would boycotting oh. them in favor of other Orthodox churches be the best solution? Yeah, and Layman, you're in a better position than I am. <laughs> I, uh, like, clergy, I always say, it's like we're in the, the military, the army or something like that. So, um... You know, you lady have a lot of power. Uh, first things, I'm I'm kind of shocked that more people haven't been writing the bishops. Right. Uh, that that's the first thing that you can do, and you know, and we clergy can sign off on it. But if it's just from us clergy, the the bishops are gonna be like, "Oh, great, here's the complainers, always complaining, <laughs> right? like the um, but they're shepherds of the flock." Um, and they need to hear from right. from you. Um, the other thing too is, I would say, yeah, go to. If you're a lady, I'd encourage you to stay away from problematic jurisdictions. Right. But don't you know? I wouldn't encourage anybody to to do that. So great question. Um, I I don't know if you happen to see the uh, Rocor response from the Archbishop. Uh, Peter in Chicago, yeah, I believe. Peter in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he compared what we're seeing a lot with the Bolshevik Revolution, which I um, I greatly respected because that that was the strongest language of condemnation that I had seen out of Orthodoxy, uh, given Go Arch, given um, uh, their Arch uh, Bishop there, uh, and just some of the soft rhetoric and peddling these language of equality, just seems really problematic to me um i know brother augustine another fellow orthodox youtuber has a, had a big problem with the shutting down of the churches just by taking orders uh from the secular world uh seems to give people apprehension in, in regards to where the authority of the church is is coming from you know is it is it god i but i understand the hysteria regarding covid and all the things coming out but um it, it it seems very, t even at my church, the clergy uh, is becoming, well, my subdeacon, uh, we have private conversations. And even, even the father, uh, you know, just like the, the talk about these plastic spoons and changing the Eucharist, there's no way that they were going to do that at my church. Uh, and so it seems like people are, are seeing these modernist movements or progressive ideology and changes and orthodoxy. So I think it is definitely on us as laity, all the young men here that are listening and trying to learn more about theology that uh, we, as Father Deacon Ananias tells us, we do have more power than we think, and we need to learn the learn the faith, practice the faith, and then hold those accountable who aren't doing the same. Yeah, I appreciated um, Archbishop Peters, because you tend to get this always from the jurisdictions. This is kind of like virtue signal, hat tip to where the secular popular establishment um, narrative that they want to hear. Um, and it's really unfortunate. One of the problems I was thinking that actually could be is that when Father Peter hears a talk about this, that one of the hardest things for American Orthodox acquiring the phronimos of the church, the mm. spirit of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, Orthodoxy hasn't been here long. We have all these other cultures and religions that even when we convert, we bring all this baggage in. And 
one of the cultures that we have um, is the lack of persecution. Mm. Uh, this sort of kind of prosperity and trust in our government, a kind of blind trust, whereas most all the other Orthodox countries don't have that same trust in the establishment. Why? Because they've gone through the persecutions. They all know better. Like, um, you don't, you know, we put our trust in, in God, in the church. And I think that's one thing that's came to become particularly evident um, within American orthodoxy is that when we made all these synods and these decisions about the Karanka um, <laughs> and social tensions and stuff like that, um, where do we look to? We look to the secular state, the secular establishment, the modern medical abortionist eugenicists. Right. Uh, um, these are the people, the insurance adjusters, the lawyers, secular lawyers. <laughs> these are the people that we surround ourselves with. Um, that is not the spirit of orthodoxy. It is not the history of orthodoxy, and that's going to be our struggle. And because we haven't been persecuted, we have no fighters people who are willing to to go to death. Um, so that's kind of my take. I know mm. a lot of clergy, including myself, are not happy with what's going on. We're obedient. Um, but we have a process of dealing with this. That's why I said that you'd uh, be surprised. You have more power than you think, right? Your hierarchs. Um, talk to your priests about mm -hmm. um, and organize and get the information out there. Absolutely. Thank you for that response. We had another super chat from uh, Zygmas, $10. Thank you very much, brother. He says, how does one choose which Orthodox church to attend? I believe he was the one that had been learning a lot about Orthodoxy, but had yet to attend a divine liturgy. Do you have any? So, Go ahead. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, so what you're going to do is you want to like ex experiment with going to a lot of different parishes because, again, I'd say stay away from the problematic jurisdictions and parishes. Um, there's certain questions that you could ask about, uh, let's say, suppose there's a problematic priest. There's certain questions on stances um, that are orthodox stances that the priest um, needs to hold to that you could ask. Um, but most importantly, you want to attend different parishes to see what fits well for you, what you're comfortable with. Um, and that's going to be like a dynamic of the people, the way the, the, the priest um, interacts with the people. And so I would say that initially you might start attending um, some highly uh, populated convert parishes. That I have a high percentage of just because if you're going straight into orthodoxy and you go into a Russian, Serbian, or Romanian parish is completely a different language, it might be a bit too much too fast mm -hmm. um, for you and you might feel uncomfortable. Um, so, again, experiment with different parishes going around different Sundays. See what's a good fit. You might initially want to start attending a high percentage convert parish if you'd like to step up the level um, and go further and get some of those tools to go further in your faith. And then you could perhaps go to some of the more ethnic parishes. Mm. Why, why do I say that? Um, now, that's going to get you out of your comfort zone because... Um, someone might do the whole thing in their own, you know, native tongue, in which you have to work really hard to kind of learn that. <laughs> um, that would get you out of your comfort zone. But what's the benefit of doing something like that? And not all of them are come always, sometimes they mix up the, the language. You do about 60, 40 English, Romanian. But 
I feel that if you'd like to work harder later on, okay, in orthodoxy, um, these cultures, their orthodox roots go very deep. They acquired the phronimos of the, of the church, mm -hmm. uh, the spirit of the church. Um, and for us American Orthodox that are having a hard time with that, that can really help us. But again, um, yeah, you can leave that for – some people decide just to go straight to like a rope holder and have it all Russian. Um, do what you're comfortable with, and then as you pr progress on, um, push yourself out of the comfort zones. Right. That's great advice. Um, another super chat from – oh, Joe Norton gave – $25. Thank you very much. He says, great discussion, mostly over my head, but love it. Um, and then Zygmunt, the gentleman who was asking about which Orthodox church to attend, uh, sent another $5 saying, super chatting YouTube theologians when the churches are closed is modern day tithing. <laughs> um, and then Byzantine warrior said, generally wondering and not trolling, would getting baptized in a swamp or in mud be a valid baptism? Asking on behalf of the autistic live chat. <laughs> I guess that Asking was a debate. For a friend. Yeah, that was a debate earlier if a if a baptism in a swamp uh, would be valid or not. Uh, yeah, I, I doubt that would be. Um, it needs to be now. <laughs> There might be a principle of economy where it's like, hey, man, he's going to die in four minutes and we don't have any water, right? <laughs> yeah. And the bishop's like, go for it, right? Like, it's a fly con. Beyond that, like some type of a weird thing like that. I... Yeah. So, yeah. So that that is our stance on that. And then Owen uh, sent another five pounds. Thank you very much. He says, we should launch an email raid on GoArch and its bishops to complain about their actions as of late. We need to organize. Uh, we need to organize and attack. Agreed. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that, maybe we just need to be more organized. No, I, I, and this is something that I've been, I was actually going to make a video specifically on this. I wanted to think it out and give it more, uh, more formation but owen the gentleman who asked the question has been doing a great job of building telegram followings for orthodox guys and uh he's got one that i believe it's a thousand or at least close to a thousand people and of course that is a private uh, direct encrypted message where we can't be shut down by the social media platforms but i i for example at my parish very small i think we only have like 50 people at our church but we're starting a men's group and I, one of the things that I want to talk about in a video is regarding how we can start to build organized formations in the name of orthodoxy and, and being condoned within the church. I'm not talking about going outside the church, but it seemed like talking to some of my clergy that if we started to build men's groups and then men's groups being in contact with other orthodox churches in their area and they have men's groups, that this would be a way to really start organizing, doing events together, even um, – just like you and Jay presented papers, but more um, doing conventions, doing talks where we do more academic stuff, but maybe it's more cultural stuff together, but just being more organized and being a force within culture itself, that's the only way we can really make a difference. I know that my godfather is um, working on uh, like, with some other priests and stuff, developing uh, a men's group across the nation and maybe even internationally. So maybe I'll that would be perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind in regards to being condoned by the church, you know, all being approved by your parish's priest, but uh, just being organized. Because uh, you look around, and that's one of the problems with the Protestants. Um, in regards to their, you know, their infinite numbers of interpretation and, and differentiation. But as Orthodox, especially all these young guys, because we're, we're promoting ideas that are countercultural. I mean, we are the counterculture at this point. You know, it's totally different from the 1960s where they're breaking up the hegemony of the Protestant Christian ethos in America. That's already been broken up. 
now we have to break up the progressive, satanic, relativistic ethos that's dominating this country and looks like dominating most of Western civilization. Yeah, and infecting orthodoxy too. You know, I was thinking about, I'll, I'll maybe do a video about about this, but, you know, you always hear people talking about uh, we need to unify and we shouldn't, you know, say these things with this divisive and uh, the orthodox brethren and it's, um, we need to build more bridges and stuff like that. And I find there's been one good thing from the whole Quanta crisis is that it's revealed something. It's been a, a sort of revealing of what I believe has been something that was masked um, before, that we really didn't see it. And it, what that is is that we have people in the church that hold fundamentally different worldviews. who are all professing to be Orthodox Christians. And I guess sometimes prior we could say, well, can't we all get along? And typically we'd think that, um, well, it's just divisive when politics are brought up. So he's either a liberal or a conservative, right? And so people would say, well, we should, we should build bridges and talk across the aisle. Like, we shouldn't be so divisive. And what I'm going to say is that something runs deeper than the the politics. Well, I mean, we always think it ends at the politics. Like, well, they believe that because they're left, and they believe that becomes the conservative. Now, what I realized through the Karanka crisis is something underlying even those political paradigms mm -hmm. that would explain why somebody would actually be left versus liberal or conservative, progressive, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is that we have two worldviews that are fundamentally incompatible. There are no bridges to be, to be made. Um, and so unity with paradigms that are incompa fundamentally incompatible, I don't think is a good thing. It's almost like saying, well, should we just be like nice? And like nice is not a virtue. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you know, crisis in, in Greek means judgment. It's like we're at a fork in the road that we didn't see, that we, perhaps we thought we could unite and have different kind of viewpoints and stuff. And I'm not saying people, everybody has to have the exact same. What I'm saying is what I realized through this is there's some underlying paradigms of people in the Orthodox Church that I didn't see before that are now we're at a fork in the road. Right. Or a crisis that's revealed this, there's no bridging. It would be wrong to even attempt to do that. Right. And what we saw, kind of what I talked about, is that we saw a group of people in the Orthodox Church say that who are the people that they trusted and were getting all their information from? The secular, state, abortionist, eugenics. Yep. The, the technocrats, mm -hmm. the lawyers, the insurance adjusters, not one of these people consulted holy elders and the pious and the ascetics. Everybody that was saying, you know, um, granny killer, stay home, stay, you know, save lives and all this stuff, were, who are you putting your trust in? So I think this crisis showed me in a good way, uh, we have people in the church that fundamentally believe have made idols. Yes. They do not, they're not orthodox. They are not putting their trust because how do we get our information? Where does our trust comes from? Credentials and our credentials aren't academic and they're not secular. They're aesthetic, right? It's through piety. Um, and so you saw two different narratives. Now I ask all of you this, are those compatible worldviews? No. Should we build bridges between so we can all get along? I think that 
this is a good thing that this is a wheat being separated from the chaff. It's yep. a crisis to show that these are not our people. Um, and you're going to have to make a choice of who are you putting your trust in. Yep. No, that and was it's the same it's the same thing with everything going on right now too with all the Marxist it, stuff too. Exactly. And revolution. And if you can't see I can't believe people can't actually see. Um, that's a good thing about reading the history of philosophy and the Frankfurt School and the critical theorists and the Marxists <laughs> is that I'm like <laughs> this is not about um, what you think it is. Right. It's a spirit of revolution. It's demonic and it's Marxist. Exactly. And you're going to have to make a choice whose side are you on. It's a, it, it, very well put, and I couldn't agree more. It's, a, it's exactly what seems to be happening. And 2020, um, at a metaphorical level, just seems to be that everybody's getting clearer and clearer perception. We're getting a clearer perception of the weakness of Donald Trump and the sort of the, the falsity of his rhetoric, this tough rhetoric. We're, we're seeing... The, you know, what has he done to, like, like stop any of this? Stuff? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's incredible. You know, so it seems like truth, logos, you know, that's why I, I like the phrase logos right even though i know that can be misconstrued in different ways but generally speaking in regards to it seems like there is a cultural phenomenon of young men who are who are you know sincerely see seeking truth and they're finding christianity and then they're moving through christianity eventually they're finding orthodoxy and and this has been so eye-opening just as you said that i realize that even orthodoxy in it as a church isn't the answer that it's on me as finding the faith, and then it's on me on finding a parish that's holding the faith. Because clearly, even within orthodoxy, if I put all my faith in the church, at least in some of the leaders now, it's like I'm going to be let down just like I was. And uh, and so it, it then it, it causes me to put on more responsibility on my own shoulders, which is ultimately a source of freedom. Yeah, find a holy, find a holy person. Well, I'm so I can't tell you how blessed I am that my priest and spiritual father, um, he has the credentials, his spiritual credentials, um, and the priests look up to him. And you know, I I put my whole life in his hands. I, I trust my spiritual father. Um, some you know I've been blessed, and sometimes it takes people a long time to find the right spiritual father. And but, you know, ask around, like, look for who's actually practicing the Orthodox faith. Mm -hmm. And it's usually not Orthodox academics, and I can say so <sighs> because in academia, uh -huh. um, go to those practicing spirituality and uh, get counsel and advice. Absolutely. Stay away from the secularism. Absolutely. The, for, the Fordhamites. I mean, I can't – and I, this is the last thing I know you, I, I'm trying to – save your time but um it's just amazing the stuff i keep seeing coming out of those people on twitter it's just it, my mouth drops it's just crazy i mean they're orthodox in name only yeah i think they do it on purpose to to even um agitate i wouldn't doubt it i wouldn't doubt it so close out we, the way, uh, yeah go ahead, just go ahead. before we close yeah. out i'd like to say is that you know where the holy spirit is where there's peace. Mm. Yeah. So if you see agitation and um, you know, discord, and I don't mean the server. <laughs> yeah. Um, Father that has a spirit of peace. Right. And last thing, we got a, a late super chat by Pano Costa Uros. Uh, and brother, hit me up if you wanted to have lunch in Indianapolis someday. He says, men with, quote, men with men committing that which is unseemly, unquote, dot, 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 to the hyper-feminist ecumenical. Um, yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't like our men's group ideas, but that's exactly what needs to be restored. And uh, some of the things that I've spoke about on, in previous videos is, is Jacques Derrida and his grammatology, the concept of foul logocentrism, and, and that really being the concept that's, that is being attacked right here. We see it within, you know, the the revolution that's occurring right now. But it's it's the it's the masculine principle that that Christianity is tied to, and then this all all the presuppositions that are tied into a logos centered worldview, objective reality, objective truth, logic, all these different things. 
And he was open in his book, you know, Grammatology, about how this needed to be undone because he was under the postmodern literary theories of infinite interpretation and all this stuff. And, and so relativism is, you know, that, that key evil that we, we keep fighting. And, and I think that concept of phallogocentrism um, is useful in seeing what exactly the academics on the opposite side are really in opposition to. So, anyways, thank you very much, Father Deacon, Doctor Ananias. You. Thank you so much. Um, where can people find you and reach out? I mean, I mean, I'm sure most people here are already subscribers to uh, the Norwegian News, your YouTube channel. Um, but is there anything that you'd like to to say before we close off? Um, keep your Orthodox brothers, keep myself, my families, and the world in your prayers. Um, that's our praxis and, um, let's all just encourage each other yeah. to, um, you know, get deeper in our prayer, um, and support one another. Um, this is a revolution yes. um, and orthodoxy is the last rebellion, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so you can find my material on, on Norwegian news. Sorry, it's been a while since I put up videos. Like I said, I was getting all my equipment restored and my own restoration. And I will be, I'll make a video kind of announcing for the, the next logic course. But, um, and then I'm thinking perhaps in the future, even designing some more courses, perhaps on Aristotle. Mm, um, oh, that'd be great. I'd definitely be interested in that. Modology. Um, different stuff in philosophy, maybe a philosophy of mind course, something like that. My, I got my basic so, works right here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I love, love the logic. It's a uh, logic's, I mean, it's one of the most abstract, practical things in philosophy. Oh, what's so sad is being a, somebody working on their PhD is how many fellow students have no clue what logic is and the name and the fact that they're getting PhDs and be considered academics or intellectuals is astonishing. It's infuriating and it's saddening to know what the university system is. But they, they took all the Marxist gender um, <laughs> women's studies courses, didn't they? Yeah, it's crazy. Are we surprised that they're like all these young people are like burning down and looting and <laughs> have created uh what's the place in seattle now the oh uh, the autonomous zone <laughs> it's like we've been training to be marxist revolutionaries um in grade school like yep. what do you expect yep well yeah without logic yeah don't give them the logic <laughs> give them the emotion it, they live yeah. in a they live in emotionalism and therefore they live in subjectivism which therefore is a relativism which then evil can exist that's the whole trick right that that's how the devil uh convinces people he doesn't exist is a relativistic worldview so so thank you again so much for having me no it's thank you we'll have to do much more oh yeah absolutely and thank you again man this was phenomenal i'm sure it helped so many people so Thank you. God bless you and your family. Stay safe uh, being in, in California, the, the real Marxist war zone. So hopefully you guys are in a good place. But thank you. And to everyone out there, thank you guys. Thank you for all the love and support. And until next time, as always, us.